List views are something that you'll need all the time in Flutterflow. And the majority of the time that will be to render data that comes from your backend. Although I use Firebase for auth and push notifications, I try to avoid using Firestore for my actual data because honestly, I find it too limiting for a real application. It's possible you'll be using something like BuildShip or some other type of API that you don't control, but you'll apply this approach to any API that's not Firebase or Supabase. So before we add our list view, I'm just gonna pop in a container here. This can really help for help with things like shrink wrapping and that sort of thing sometimes. The list view goes inside of the container. And then again, I'll like to put another container in here. And this is useful for things like fills and shading and whatever you want to do with it later on. Then I'll add a list tile. It doesn't have to be a list tile. It can actually just be a row and add some images and some text and other columns. You can do whatever you want inside of the list view, but the list tile is really helpful because you can uh, have a slide left motion, for example, with a little delete icon and icons on either side. It's, it's just a helpful widget. Now let's visit the API call section. And here I'm just going to use the, what I'm calling the entity endpoints. This can be any kind of endpoint to have like user endpoints and notification and public endpoints, all kinds of things that it'll depend on what kind of app you're using and what kind of backend you have. In my case, I need to authorize. So I do actually have another video on this, but essentially I'm using a bearer authentication method and passing in the auth token with each request. So I have my base URL and then I have another API call below that that is using this base URL. It's gonna attach the token and then it's gonna hit the correct endpoint, which in this case is, uh, I'm just calling it my entities. Uh, I also have pagination on this endpoint. So I do have some variables, for example, page, and there's another one called size, and those are optional, but it depends on the way that your endpoint will return the data for you. There's one other thing with uh, API endpoints. I've found some kind of strange things have appeared in certain API endpoints when I don't decode the response as UTF-8. So this is usually off by default with Flutterflow. So it's a good idea to turn it on and then just do that for all of the API endpoints and you won't have any problems with strange ASCII symbols. The endpoint that I'll use it as an example here is the My Entities endpoint. And this returns a paginated list of items with each of the entity on it. So we've got like a user ID that's associated with the current user in Firebase. That's the Firebase token and like a name and a description. It's just kind of a dummy endpoint. So now we'll add a backend query onto the list view itself. It's generally better if you can to put the backend query on the list view widget. You can also put it on the page root as well, but try to avoid it putting on containers and on columns for performance reasons. So we'll add a query, we go for API call, and we'll choose the API call. In our case, it's this get entity index. I'll set a variable on top of here it's gonna be the auth token. The auth token needs to get passed into these external API calls. It's pretty rare that you would be pulling, you know, in a real application, pulling data that's not authenticated. Usually I'm gonna be pulling information that's associated with my user. Let's say that I wanna get the list of my push notifications. I need to tell the API who I am and I do that through an ID token. In this case, I'm using Firebase auth, so I can just use this ID token that Flutterflow provides and pass it into my uh, Python backend, which also knows about the Firebase project that I'm using. So I'll confirm that. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm going to create some dynamic children so that all of the entries in the list view will appear in the application. I have to give it a name, so we'll just call it the entities list, I suppose. And its value is going to come from the response of the backend query, which will be the get entity index response. And for now, I'll just use a JSON path. And this is actually dot items. And it needs a dollar sign. So this will grab everything that's in the dot items, which is sort of the root of the uh, response from the API. And that's where I'll have access to the list itself. Now, when I go to save this, Flutterflow will tell me, okay, you're going to create dynamic children here. So we say, yes, that's okay. At this point, we can dive in to the list view itself. And you know, if you have rows and text and things here, you can manipulate them directly. In my case, I have this list tile widget. So the first thing that I'm gonna do is change the text. Uh, so that's the subtitle, here's the title. And I'm going to use not the get entities index response. I do have access to the entire list from the backend call, but I want the list item, one of the children. 
And so I can go JSON path, and I know that one of the um, fields on here is, for example, name, and no further changes, and that's good. And then let's do the description as well. So there's a subtitle on this uh, list tile widget, so I can grab that and I can say, all right, JSON path, and I'll go for description. Cool. At this point, we can test the application, and I'll show you some useful tricks with API calls in the console while we're testing it. One thing that I always do when I'm testing the application in the browser using Flutterflow's debug mode is I open the console, and this will show me the API calls. You can actually see this here if you go to troubleshooting info. You can see how to open the browser console. So there'll be a couple of requests that maybe won't be as relevant to you. A good idea is to click the fetch XHR. And you can also hit control L uh, on a Mac, I guess it's command L. And you can see what the API calls are doing. So I'm gonna visit the page with my list view. And here is my list view with all of the different um, pieces of data that are coming directly from my API. I can click on this, my entities, and so here I can see that I have my header. I've attached my bearer. I added this string in my API call and then Flutterflow attached the token. This is the JWT token that comes from Firebase and was available in the UI for Flutterflow. And that's going to allow my API to be authenticated. And the token can even identify me. It knows about my email. It knows about my Firebase uh, unique ID and various other pieces of information like uh, full name and, and uh, photo. If I go to the preview tab, I can see the items, and these are the three items that are being displayed in Flutterflow. So that's quite useful, I have it all here. So now we'll take this a step further. I'm gonna grab one little piece of this JSON output, one of my uh, entities that has this user ID, name, and description. And I'm going to structure the data in a slightly more coherent way. Uh, so we'll go back to Flutterflow. As your app becomes more complex, you'll start seeing a lot of confusion with JSON paths because you'll have JSON paths all over the place. And if you want to change something, you'll have to change it in a lot of different places. It's gonna cause a huge number of bugs. What you should instead do is structure your data using data types. So I just copied a little bit of JSON from my entities endpoint. So I'm going to create a data type from JSON. So I'll paste it in here. One thing I need to do is remove the ID because unfortunately Flutterflow doesn't like data types with an underscore and this is what MongoDB gives me. So I'll have to remove that. If you have an ID from, for example, a Postgres database, it's much more convenient to just leave it in there. However, um, I still have the fields that I can use. I actually will remove user ID as well. I don't need that right now. And just make sure that the JSON is formatted properly and give it a name. We'll give this data type a name of entity, for example. And so after I've created the data type, I can always just add and remove fields um, at my ledger. But at the moment, I just have a very simple data type called an entity with a name and a description, which are the two fields that I have in each element of my list view. Next, I'll go back to my API call. And this time I'm going to go to response and test. And the point of this is that I want my response to be parsed as a data type. And the data type that I want it to be parsed as is the entity that I just created. And this is actually a list of entities. So I click is list and then I save that. Okay, now each element in my list is going to be coaxed into a data type. So I'll still, in my dynamic children, I'll still use JSON body path and then items. But now, instead of no further cha changes, I'm going to coax it into a data type. And the data type I'm going to give it to is uh, called entity. And this is a list of entities. The items will give me a list of entities. And then each one of those is going to be an entity object. And I'll save that. Now I'll head into each individual element in my list tile. And instead of using the JSON path, I can now structure it in, in a much nicer way. So I'll say this entity's list item is going to actually be a data structure field. And this one is name. And so I have name and description available to me because I created this data type. This is really, really useful for, for preventing bugs. So I'll do the same with description. It will be a data structure field and it will be the description. Now everything is so much cleaner and so much tidier. And when I know what I'm getting back from my API, I can coax it into the right data type 
and it will reduce bugs hugely. And the last thing I want to talk about is pagination. Because sometimes you'll have a list and it could have literally thousands of elements in the database and you can't just return all of those. Even if you were to filter and sort those on the front end in Flutterflow, it would still take a really long time to do that API call. And maybe you just want to show the first eight elements or maybe you want to have an infinite list. Like for example, if you think of the feed on Instagram, say so the user is continuously scrolling and it never really seems like it's doing any API calls in the background. It's just this data is infinitely there. This is easy enough in Firestore, but it's also, also very easy if your backend is set up properly for your own API calls. So we'll turn on infinite scroll I use Python on the back end and I use FastAPI. And what FastAPI, there's a library called um, FastAPI Pagination. And that handles a lot of the database querying in terms of returning chunks of your index arrays. And so you can have, let's say, 50 items and that's the first page and then another 50 items and that's the second page and so forth. For that, and I can talk about FastAPI Pagination in another video, just drop a comment and, and ask me if you want to go through it. But in the Flutterflow side, all we have to do is set the page parameter. And then because we checked infinite scroll, we have a next page index that Flutterflow gives us. So we, all we have to do is turn that on. And then we have pagination and infinite scroll with our uh, external API endpoint. I also like to turn on uh, enable pull to refresh. I find that really useful so the user can refresh um, if anything has changed in the data uh, since the last database call. And that's list views in Flutterflow. And once you have these fundamentals, you can play around now with styling and changing to the horizontal orientation. You can also do grid views because the principle with the API calls and the dynamic children is exactly the same with the grid view widget. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe if you're finding the content helpful and I'll see you in the next one.